This morning we're in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll be looking at the last eight verses of this chapter today. Hebrews 10, we'll be looking at verses 32 through 39. Hebrews 10, verse 32. The Bible tells us this. But call to remembrance the former days, in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly, whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly, whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you the day, we give you our hearts. We ask that you would find every heart tender pliable, sensitive, and responsive in your hands today. We pray that you would open up the truth of your precious word that you've entrusted to us. Help us to learn from it today. We pray that we would see lives that leave here this morning completely and radically changed. And that for those who are believers, we'd be built up in the faith. We would be brought to further on to maturity that we would be anchored in confidence in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our text here this morning exhorts us to have unshakable confidence at all times, but particularly in times of persecution and opposition. It's a tough topic to speak about because most likely, as was already mentioned this morning, None of us have ever experienced what could legitimately be called persecution for our faith. I'm sure most of us have faced instances of reproach or rejection or mockery when people discovered that we believed in Christ. Uh, personally, I've lost three different jobs due to standing for the truth of God's word. I've had people say false things about me and slander me at times, but I've never been beaten I've never been tortured. I've never been thrown in prison because of my faith. I've never had my property confiscated or my family ripped away from me just because I confess Jesus Christ as Lord. It's probably true of most of you too. A pastor who has suffered real persecution could deliver a much more powerful and more credible message than I can about this topic. Paul himself could actually say that he bore in his body the marks of suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is that we are very much um, isolated from persecution. We live in a very sanitized and, uh, and fairly uh, religion or Christian friendly uh, culture. You go to many countries around the world, even today, that's not the case. But we're very much insulated from that ourselves. Another reason that it's tough for us to speak on this topic today is that Western Christians for many years now have been brought into a very false view of the Christian life that emphasizes the benefits of the faith in this life. You know, people have been inundated with the philosophy that God has a wonderful plan for your life. Just trust in Jesus. He'll help you overcome all your problems. You'll be able to enjoy life to the fullest. That is the prevailing philosophy that claims to be Christian in our day and age. People immediately then begin thinking about all the things that they want in life to make them happy. 
Jesus is marketed as the solution to everything from weight loss, to success in business, to having a happy marriage. But the sales pitch is that receiving Christ will bring you the greatest happiness in this life. Somehow, getting persecuted and losing your material possessions and possibly even your life doesn't harmonize with that message. Most people today sign up for the prosperity plan, not the persecution plan. They want the best life now. When people encounter difficult trials then, they get angry at God. They frequently decide if that's the way that God's gonna treat me or if those are the things that he's gonna allow into my life, I'm not going to follow him. Hardship, persecution, and suffering aren't part of the deal that I signed up for. Now, how could people have strayed so incredibly far from the biblical picture of the Christian life? It is often in the scriptures referred to as a fight or as a war, neither of which are pleasant things to be engaged in. Many passages in the Bible tell us to expect trials and hardships because if Satan and his world system hate Jesus Christ, they're going to hate his followers as well. They're especially going to despise those who share the convicting truth of the Word of God. The abundant life that Jesus promised has nothing to do with a trouble-free life. It has to do with the joy that we can have in the midst of tribulation. He plainly stated the requirements for following Him. This is what Jesus had to say, deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. A cross was not just a slightly irritating circumstance, by the way. It was an instrument of slow, torturous death. Well, our text today in Hebrews comes on the heels of a very strong warning against apostasy. We took a break last week since we had a missionary here, but two weeks ago, I hope that you remember in verses 26 through 31, uh, was this profound warning, probably the sternest warning out of all the warnings in the book of Hebrews, that since you have been enlightened by the truth, if you turn away from it, there's nothing but the severe judgment of God that's left for you. Now, Paul doesn't claim to know any specific heart in his writing here, but he was well aware of the temptation of these readers he was addressing to turn away from the teaching um, about the need for faith in Jesus Christ alone. But uh, Paul assumes the best about his readers here. He encourages them by saying that he knows that they're not going to turn back their confidence in Christ and that they'll steadfastly stand in faith in spite of whatever hardships they may suffer. That was his confidence about them. He knew there was a temptation to draw back. But Paul shows how to have unshakable confidence that endures any kind of trial, any kind of temptation, but especially the trial of persecution. Folks, if you're going to make it as a Christian, you must learn to apply what he says here about enduring faith, about unshakable confidence. This is what he says in a nutshell. To have faith or confidence that endures trials Remember how God worked in the past. Focus on doing his will in the present. And look to his promises for the future. Before we work our way through this text today, there's one other introductory thought that will be very, very helpful to keep in mind. Jesus Christ's parable about the sower and the seed serves as a very useful backdrop to our text. Jesus described the Word of God as seed that is sown or planted on four different types of soil. This is so important to understand for, uh, for ourselves as we evaluate and analyze our own hearts. It's critical to understand as we look at and analyze the hearts of other people. Whether we're trying to sow the Word of God in their hearts in the area of evangelism and the need for their faith in the gospel, or whether it's some other truth that they're being confronted with. As he described the seed of the Word of God that was planted on different types of ground, some fell on the hardened, compacted surface of the roadside, where it couldn't grow at all. It couldn't penetrate 
and uh, the birds just came and ate it, keeping it, keeping it from ever taking root or sprouting. That represents unbelievers who hear God's truth, but don't understand it or don't believe it. And so it's completely lost on them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where the sun would absorb into those rocks and it would produce a very warm environment, but there was no depth of soil for the roots to grow down into. And that seed very quickly sprung up, but having no roots, it withered away. And that represents those who hear the word of God and they immediately receive it with joy. Uh, listen, they have an emotional response or they have a mental acknowledgement of the truth, but the truth just shallowly penetrates the surface and it can't grow beyond that because there's no real depth. There's no real life. The truth doesn't reach the, the depths of the person's soul and it doesn't bring any lasting change as a result. The mind is affected but the heart is not affected. And there's no heartfelt repentance and faith. And for that person, when difficulty or when persecution or troubles or opposition arise, whatever form that may take, they show their true colors and they quickly fade away. They draw back. Other seed fell on the third type of soil, which is infested with weeds. The seed sprouts, but before the fruit of repentance ever comes about, the weeds representing riches, pleasures, and cares of this life, according to Luke 8, 14, they choke out the word. And it can't bring forth any fruit as the weeds shroud it from any further illumination from the sun and from any nutrients. And another seed fell on the fourth type of soil, which is good soil. It represents those who hear, understand, accept the word of God in both the mind and the heart, and then they bear fruit that actually sticks. In my understanding, only the fourth type of soil represents true believers who believe to the saving of the soul, as we read here in this text. The rocky soil and the thorny soil are both representative of people who make a profession of faith verbally for a while but eventually they draw back into perdition. In other words, genuine saving faith endures trials. It endures anything that the world can throw at it and it will still bear fruit. The amount of fruit will vary. It's not exactly the same in every person we understand. Jesus said that some bears a hundredfold, some bears 60 fold, some bears 30 fold, but there will be observable evidence of a transformed heart. Here's my challenge today. Challenge every person that's listening to this to examine yourself and see if there's any possibility that this is talking about you. And if there is any possibility that's talking about you, deal with it urgently today. True believers may fail under pressure like Peter did when he denied Jesus Christ. Every believer struggles against daily sin, not always victoriously, but if God has changed the heart and if if the believer is connected to the vine, that believer will repent, will still retain unshakable confidence, and will bear fruit that proves salvation. So, here's our first thought today. Very simple thoughts, but the first is that to have unshakable confidence through any trial, remember how God worked in the past. Verse 32, once again, says this, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. And then he goes on and, and talks about some of those afflictions. And Paul begins by calling their attention to the former days. That refers to the time just after these Hebrew Christians had been saved. Paul draws their minds back to how God had worked in their lives during that time despite some very difficult circumstances. He tells them, hey, you guys did very well then. You did, uh, you did well at that point in time. And so hang in there now and hang in there in the future whenever persecution hits. He reminds those, uh, those readers of three things that were true of them as new converts. And these are things that are also true of all believers. 
These are some proofs or some evidences of salvation. And so uh, let me walk through those with you real quick as, as I look back and I reflect on what God has done in my life when I was saved. And as you look back on that, and as Paul told these believers to look back on that, first of all, remember how God enlightened you with a new godly understanding of life, a new understanding of truth. Unbelievers are described in Scripture all throughout as being spiritually blind to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Only God is able to command the light to shine out of darkness. In, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul gives an illustration of this, and he says that he commanded the light uh, to shine out of darkness at the beginning of the universe, during creation. He created light where there was only darkness. In the same way, Paul draws that illustration across to say that he hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Before God opened our eyes by illuminating us with his truth from the word of God, friends, if you're anything like me, and I know that you are, we didn't see our need for the Savior. There was no understanding of that. We didn't see our sin. We thought we were good enough to be made right with God and get into heaven by our own righteousness, or we just simply didn't care about being made right with God at all. We had no idea how terrible our sins were or how holy God was. We didn't appreciate the fact that the Son of God gave himself on the cross to pay our debt of sin. But while we were in such incredible, blind darkness, God graciously shined his truth into our hearts. Like the sun uh, bursting over the darkened landscape and illuminating everything clearly that had been blacked out before. John Newton wrote, he wrote about this in his famous hymn, Amazing Grace, by saying, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The illumination of our understanding with the truth of God's word is one of the most precious gifts that God gives. I want to remind you that this is a clear contrast from what we read in that stern warning that he gave in verses 26 through 31, where he talked about people who had been enlightened. And so I have to remind you that regardless of how fantastic it might be that God enlightens our understanding with truth, that the apostates who were departing from the faith in Paul's day had experienced some degree of enlightenment also, and yet they weren't truly saved. Back in chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul had also mentioned this in, in a very similar warning. You can be enlightened with the truth. You can taste the good word of God. And you can fall away by allowing your heart to be turned from that truth. It is possible to have a fair amount of theological understanding and yet still be lost. It's possible to know a lot of truth and even acknowledge that truth mentally, but not have the heart really changed. Right. People have devoted their entire lives to studying the Bible and writing scholarly books without repenting of their sins or trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior. They are enlightened, as, is, as it's called here, but they're headed for eternal destruction. And so Paul calls these folks back to remembrance about some wonderful events that have taken place in their lives and which are true of any regenerate person today as well. First of all, uh, remember how God enlightened you. With, uh, with new understanding. And then also remember your newfound joy in the Lord, no matter what your circumstances are. And I don't mean to be trite here, but coming to Christ is kind of like falling in love. The Lord rebuked the Ephesian church for losing their first love, told them to remember from whence they fell and repent. These Hebrew Christians had known the same exuberance when they first come to faith in Jesus Christ. Not long into it, they encountered some real difficult trials. Paul calls it here, after they were enlightened, they experienced a great fight of afflictions. Our word, athletic, uh, 
comes from the Greek word that's translated as fight there. It was like uh, what, they, what they engaged in or what they experienced after coming to, um, to enlightenment of the truth of God. It was like a hard-fought athletic contest, a, a wrestling match with Satan vying for their souls. Some of them, it says, were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. We get our word theater from the Greek word that's translated gazing stock here. As you know already, when somebody from a strong Jewish family embraces Jesus Christ as the Messiah, he's made a spectacle. Ridiculed and rejected by his friends, by his family, and by all the culture. Some of those folks had endured that. Some of these Hebrew Christians had been imprisoned. Those who escaped being imprisoned showed sympathy and pity to those who were imprisoned. And they weren't ashamed to publicly identify themselves in solidarity, if I can take that word and use it in actually a positive way today. Identify themselves in solidarity with those that were in prison. They likely visited those folks in prison. They brought them food and clothing since the jails in those days didn't supply such things to prisoners. Some of those uh, new found believers lost their property either by corrupt officials taking their property from them or by mobs coming and stealing everything of value and destroying their homes. But the significant word in verse 34 is the word joyfully. They didn't just grimly endure the loss of their property. They accepted it joyfully. It's a pretty safe bet to say that most modern Christians would probably rage at such unfair treatment and file lawsuits to recover what it is that they had lost, plus damages for emotional suffering. These new believers had profound and sincere joy in knowing Jesus Christ, and they joyfully praised God as the mob hauled off their belongings and leveled their homes. They weren't rocky ground or thorny ground believers. Remember the joy in suffering for Christ. And then remember also how your values and your focus in life radically changed. He mentions that as well. Our text reveals four ways that these new believers had experienced a radical shift in their values and in their focus. If you think back to your own conversion, if you're saved, you should be able to very clearly identify with these shifts in values and focus as well. There's a change in their priorities and values from the temporal to the eternal. Very noticeable, very tangible. The only way that they could joyfully accept the seizure of their property was they knew that they had a better and an enduring substance. They had treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or corrupts, and thieves don't break through and steal. They knew that Jesus had gone to prepare a place for them to dwell, and that he was coming again to take them to be there with him. And so, while uh, absolutely no doubt it was probably hard to lose their earthly possessions, their focus had shifted from the temporal to the eternal. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19 provides a thought that you've probably read before, Paul caps all of his arguments for the resurrection with these startling words. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We need to ask ourselves if we can really say that with Paul and mean it. For us, being Christians provides us with really great lives, doesn't it? It honestly does. I have a wonderful life and children. I have all the freedoms that this country can afford to study and to teach God's word. I have brothers and sisters worldwide, and I'm blessed to be part of the most fantastic church that I could hope for. I know that my sins are forgiven. And heaven is thrown in as a bonus after this life is over. But Paul says that if we don't have hope beyond this life, and the things that this life affords, even the spiritual blessings, then being a Christian is totally miserable. What was he thinking about? 
Well, Paul was thinking with an eternal perspective rather than a temporal perspective. Why would you suffer ridicule? Why would anybody spend this short life serving the Lord? Why deny yourselves the pleasures of sin? Why bother living for anybody except yourself? It's better to eat and to drink today because tomorrow you may die. But a Christian knows that this life is not all there is. In fact, this is just a minuscule fraction of what there really is. Christians have radically shifted their priorities and their values from the temporal to the eternal. And there's also another intrinsic change that's made in values. There's a change from valuing what others think of you to valuing what God thinks of you. These new believers, it says, were, uh, were, were suffering by, or had suffered by being made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. Why put up with being made a spectacle in that way? Why not just blend in with the crowd? Why not laugh at the same filth? Why not talk the same way everybody else does? Why ought we to look different than everyone else does? Why not just give in to social pressure and be one of the guys or be one of the girls? Because their new focus wasn't on pleasing people, it was on pleasing God. God who examines the hearts. In, in looking at the negative side of this, God says in verse 38, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That tells us that God does have pleasure in those that live to please him. Worldly people live for the praise of others. They want people to like them. They want people to accept them. And so their focus tends to be on making a good impression by blending in with the world. But those who have been rescued from sin by the crucified and risen Savior live to please Him. There's another change in values and in perspective, and that is there's a shift or a change from putting self first to putting God and others ahead of self. Mark it down. Every unbeliever lives for himself or herself. Everyone. We are innately self-centered in our nature. If helping somebody else will, uh, will get us some advantage, then we'll do it. But our overall aim in life is to be happy and to get ahead, even if it means stepping on other people at times. That's human nature. But a Christian is going to focus on loving God and loving other people. By the way, those are the two great commandments according to Jesus Christ. And Christians take their focus off of self and they consider the needs of others. They have charity, which is godlike love that will sacrifice for the needs of others, even if it means sacrificing self. These Hebrew believers that Paul was writing to had showed tremendous sympathy and care for those who suffered for their newfound faith. Either they suffered themselves or they, uh, or they went and aligned themselves with those that were suffering and endured their reproach as well as a result. They were willing to share in the sufferings of those who were mistreated, and they were willing to identify with them, even if it meant being made a gazing stock to the world. And then the fourth change is that there's a change from demanding that God be fair, human concept of fairness, to submitting no matter what comes. Unbelievers want God to treat them fairly, the way that they think they deserve to be treated. What they don't understand is that if God gave them what they deserve, they'd go straight to hell. No mercy. No grace. When a tragedy strikes, you hear people rail against God and they complain, this isn't fair. I don't deserve to be treated this way. Why would God allow this to come into my life? Notice that some of the new Hebrew believers were thrown into prison, but some were not. You know, God has different purposes in what he allows for his people with regard to suffering and persecution. Our focus ought not to be in questioning his wisdom or his justice if he allows trials to come our way while other people escape from those trials. If we're the ones who aren't in the hospital or in prison for our faith, then we ought to visit those who are and show them compassion encourage their faith in God. If trials come our way, 
We should submit to God's dealings, trusting him to work all things together for our good. And so the first way to have unshakable confidence in times of trial is to remember how God worked in your life in the past. This is for a person who's genuinely saved. All of those things should be easy for a believer to identify with and to recognize in the way that God has fundamentally changed them. Remember how God saved you, how he opened your eyes to the truth. Remember your new joy in knowing Jesus Christ. Remember how faithful he was to bring you through trials. Remember how he turned your life around. Remembering those things will help you to endure by faith in the present time of trials. And so number two then, to have unshakable confidence through any trial in this life, focus on confidently doing his will in the present. So remember what he's done in the past. Confidently focus on doing his will in the present. Paul gives two aspects of this in verse 35. He says, for ye had compassion of, I'm sorry, uh, that's 34. Cast not therefore away your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Uh, he's not talking about confidence in yourself. Don't, don't let that creep into your mind at all. He's talking about confidence in Christ. We constantly hear phrases like, you've got to believe in yourself. Right? You hear that all around us all the time. That's a totally worldly idea through and through. It's not a biblical idea in any way. Our confidence is in God alone. Now, this is the fourth and the last time in the book of Hebrews that Paul uses this particular word. It's not always translated into English as confidence, but the Greek word that's translated here um, is used four times. Back in chapter 3 and verse 6. Paul exhorted us to hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. In chapter 4 and verse 16, he encouraged us to come boldly, same word, boldly unto the throne of grace. In chapter 10 and verse 19, he reminds us again that we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Our confidence in all those cases, as well as this one, is in Jesus Christ, in his shed blood, not in anything in us at all. It refers to maintaining and fearlessly testifying to God's truth in the face of persecution or trials or any difficulty. Now, that kind of confidence is at the core of saving faith. So it has great reward. Uh, namely, the reward is heaven and eternal glory with Christ. In verse 35, once again, he uses this phrase that there is great recompense of reward to be had in that confidence that's maintained. That concept of great recompense or payment is synonymous with the promise that he's about to refer to in verse 36. Both of those refer to God's promise of eternal life. And so to do God's will in the present, don't cast away your confidence. And secondly, to do God's will in the present, persevere in obedience, especially when you're tempted to compromise under pressure. Verse 36, Paul further explains by saying, for ye have need of patience. We just heard some about that this morning. Patience has to do with perseverance faithfulness, sticking it through, ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. God's will here that's mentioned, it refers to his commandments. It refers to his priorities as revealed in the word. Under the pressure of trials, it's very easy to justify moral compromise. Under the pressure of difficulties and, and strenuous um, fighting and pressure, it's easy to justify sin. Back in chapter 10, verses 7 through 9, Paul cited Psalm 40 to show that Jesus came to do the Father's will. And the Father's will that was referenced there was the cross, so that he could redeem all of creation back to himself. Folks, that wasn't easy. <laughs> Satan tempted Jesus to dodge God's will by saying this in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 8 and 9. 
I took him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The will of God was that Jesus go to the cross to redeem all of creation back to himself. Satan's offer of temptation was, you can circumvent all the difficulty, the trial, and the suffering, and I'll give you all of creation. You can have it all back. Satan's temptation was, there's no need to suffer. <clears throat> you can get what you desire without any suffering, without any difficulty at all, without having to stand for anything at all. But Jesus resisted all compromise. He steadfastly, hear me, he steadfastly obeyed God's will, even when it mo meant the most difficult suffering imaginable and a horrible death. We should also endure in obeying God explicitly even if it means suffering or persecution, even if it means death. Patiently enduring brings phenomenal maturity. It brings phenomenal growth and preparation for doing greater things for the Lord in the future. Obedience to God's word brings confidence and it brings stability to any life. This is what it says. After ye have done the will of God, after you've been obedient here in the present, you might receive the promise. That last verse, uh, or that last phrase rather of verse 36 then points on to the future, verses 37 through 39. Teach us then to have unshakable confidence through any trial, through anything in life, look to God's promises for the future. Paul adds a quote it comes from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It will, um, let's see here. It will surely come. This is from Habakkuk. You see a, a slight variation of that in the, uh, from the Greek translation in the Hebrew, or in the book of Hebrews. But it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not right in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so Paul quotes from that portion of scripture here, and he's summarizing what he's stated so far by quoting this. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, the last two studies, uh, the last one and this one today, they've given us a contrast between those whose hearts are lifted up in obstinate pride and as a result, have nothing left but the judgment of God. While the righteous, in our contrast today, will live in unshakable confidence. Paul gives really a concise uh, one-two punch here to, uh, to punctuate his teaching about how to be absolutely confident and stable in the Lord. In verse 37, he tells us to get God's perspective on time and eternity. Get God's perspective on time and eternity. Verse 37 of our text says this, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Uh, the a little while is from God's perspective of time, not from our perspective of time. In the context, we're to keep perspective on Christ's imminent return that will help to carry us through any trials. He'll return. He'll deliver his people. It's as sure as the promise of God. It's going to happen. Even if it lasts until the end of our lives, this present life is just a little while in comparison with eternity. That's why Paul could call his many trials our light affliction, which is but for a moment. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 17, he says that. And he says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, which worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. To have unshakable faith in trials now, get God's eternal perspective. And in verse 38, we're challenged then to live by faith every day. And this is going to lead us back into the, the, the glorious truths that we're going to see in chapter 11 as we get into really breaking down the nuts and bolts of what faith is. Verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. 
And so here's Jesus. He's going to return. He's going to judge. And that's the standard that he's going to use. Live by faith every single day. A genuine Christian life is not a 100-yard dash. It's not just a, a furious, quick, rapid-fire approach uh, that's, uh, that's emotionally driven. It's a marathon. It's a consistent thing. That's, that goes back right to the word patience that's used over and over here. It has to do with faithfulness. God's people, the ones that God declares righteous through faith or through, uh, uh, through, um, yeah, through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, they live by faith. That's what characterizes their lives. Now, while salvation absolutely does occur in a moment of time, with a specific yielding to the Lord, saving faith is not just a one-time action. That's where it starts. It begins at the point of salvation, and a person's soul is eternally secure. We understand at that point, according to the Word of God. But that, uh, but that saving faith, that real saving faith, is practiced and it's demonstrated by a daily, consistent confidence in God's Word and by obedience to God's Word. That's how it's shown. That's how it's proved. That's how, that's how God recognizes it. That's how we can see it plainly. Peter reminded suffering Christians of their incorruptible inheritance reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, you know, I meet many people who claim to be Christians but who live by their feelings and not by faith in God's word and in Jesus Christ. We are to walk with Christ just as we received him by God's grace through faith. And I'll, re I'll reiterate again that faith is confidence in the word of God and it's obedience to the word of God. That's the definition of faith that we're gonna come back to over and over in these next chapters. Paul is going to go on to say very shortly in chapter 11 that without faith it is impossible to please him. Failing to trust God is calling God a liar. It's questioning his integrity. Genuine faith, unfeigned faith, as we saw last time, sticks through difficult trials. False believers draw back into perdition. They see the truth, they're exposed to it. Maybe they give a mental assent to it, but they are drawn back away from obedience to the truth of God's word. And so, what are we talking about? We're talking about having unshakable confidence through any trial. And we need to look to God's promises for the future. And the way that we do that is to get God's perspective on time and eternity. To live by faith, faithful obedience every day. And let eternity govern your present way of life. Let an eternal reality govern your present way of life. And we see this in verse 39. Paul expresses his confidence that his readers, those that he's addressing, are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. He's encouraging his readers to let God's threat of eternal damnation and his readers' faith in God's truth govern the way that they live. Uh, folks, we should live in such a manner that if God's promises about heaven aren't true, we are absolutely fools to live the way that we do. Paul said this, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If we've hoped in Christ in this life only, we have nothing but misery. But if God's word is true about salvation and damnation, then living by faith in God's word is unquestionably the only choice to make. Folks, in conclusion, let me just very quickly say this. Spend your time, spend your money, spend your very life as if God's promises in the gospel are true. Remember constantly how God worked in your life in the past, if you're really saved. When you first came to faith in Jesus Christ, live in that same way now, because you know that in Christ you have a lasting better possession than you ever had here on this earth. Focus on doing God's will in the present, especially when trials tempt you to compromise. Obey him at all costs. Look to God's promises for the future and hope in that. Those three concepts, 
will give you an unshakable confidence that will sustain you through any trial as a genuine believer. Father, I thank you for the clear contrast that you've given your word of those who have uh, feigned or pretended faith in our last study versus those who have unfeigned faith in the study that we see today. How I thank you for the, the concrete truth that we can stand firmly on in the word of God. I thank you that you can give us unshakable confidence, faith that remains as we look at the word. And I pray that you'll find each of us rooting our lives firmly upon that, having the right perspective. Thank you for what you've done in my life in the past. I pray that you'll find me and your people here obeying you faithfully, patiently enduring and obeying your word, and that you'll help us to, to really focus our hearts and be captivated by your promises about the future and that our lives today would be driven by a uh, constant realization of eternity and of the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Whatever work you want to do in our hearts, whether it's shoring up of our faith in your word, um, or, or whether it's bringing someone to repentance, I pray that you would do it now today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, let's all stand together and take your hymnals and let's go to number 144. 144, it's not a typical song we would sing for an invitation, but a song day by day. It just talks about God's constant care and presence in the lives of his people and the way that we ought to be walking with him. Just reflect on that as we sing this song. Day by day. Enjoy the study of God's word together with you this morning. I pray that God's used it to firm up some things in your heart and uh, just to help you grow in, in perspective. I thank God for the maturing qualities of his word and, um, and I'm very, very thankful for each one of you. So looking forward to the, uh, the time that we'll share together in fellowship through the afternoon. So we'll go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. Jonah, can you please dismiss us? Father, as we come before your throne once again, Lord, I can't help but marvel at the amazing work that you have done in my life, changing me from a wicked sinner 
destined for Halloween to your very own child who is bound for eternal glory in the presence of my Savior. And I pray that if there is someone who is here that is never truly repented and put their faith in you, Lord, I pray that you will just be on their heart until they finally submit and take care of them. Lord, I thank you for the assurance that you have given me. I know that with each moment you give me, it's a blessing to be able to serve you. I thank you for um, the new life that you have given me and the purpose that my life now has and to serve you and to share the gospel with others. Pray that you would bless the meal, that you would bless it to our bodies, and bless the classes to all. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>